Welcome to all of you who are joining us for worship today. We are so glad that you are here. If you haven't already done so, I hope that you'll let us know that you're worshiping with us by using the online friendship form. There is a lot happening in our life together, but there are a couple of things that I want to highlight in particular. First, if you made a pledge to Trinity this year, you should have received a giving statement this week via email. Ministries continue to happen because of your generosity, and I encourage you to remember Trinity in your giving in the weeks and months ahead. Today, along with more than 200 other Presbyterian churches, we will collect a special offering to benefit the Presbyterian homes of Georgia. These funds ensure that residents receive the care they need, no matter their financial resources. I encourage you to use the link found below the video to give. Second, there will be a Zoom gathering for parents of children three years and younger on May 20th. For more information about this time of fellowship, you may contact Elizabeth Davis. And if you missed last Sunday's sermon or you want to offer help to a Trinity member or share a story for Trinity's blog, I invite you to use the Help Connect Worship tab on Trinity's website to find the most up-to-date information about what is happening in our life together and how you can get involved. Finally, this morning's flowers are given by Mr. and Mrs. Mark West to the glory of God and in loving memory of his parents, Marjorie Eichenlaub West and Charles Barry West, and her mother, Susan Heisey Ben. Spirit of life and love, we gather together from computer screens and telephones, from living rooms to front porches to dining tables, to come together as your church this day. We gather as we are able, ready to be of service to each other, to the world, ready to build the community of hope and love as we face this bright morning. We are apart, but we are together, offering our love, our commitment, our hope, and our prayers in service to each other and this world. It is a new way, but an old way that we come together in worship today. Let us worship God.
The gospel is a story of transformation, death to life, despair to hope, isolation to joy. We need that transformation maybe now more than ever. And so trusting in the grace of God and in the power of truth-telling, let us pray together. O Lord, forgive us when we are shackled by our narrow understandings of discipleship and our clouded sense of purpose. Through your spirit, we are drawn into the illumination of your empowering love. Forgive us when we are frightened of the future or pull back from the demand of your calling. Forgive us when we fail to sense your presence in our past, to acknowledge your grace in the present moment, and to trust you with our future. Through your spirit, we offer ourselves in discipleship as we seek a renewed and renewing faith. Amen. The grace of God is deeper than all that is wrong, greater than our worst fears, stronger than our frailest weaknesses. Know that you are forgiven and renewed and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. For the month of May, our scriptures come from the book of Acts. This book tells the story of Jesus's earliest followers, the first churchgoers and preachers and deacons and skeptics. This book shares their often idealized history, but from it, we can see some of our own experiences more clearly and glean wisdom about how to live as followers of the way now. Unlike the other Acts scriptures you'll hear this month, today's scripture is about an individual rather than a community. And as can be the case with lectionary texts, this is only part of the story, plucked up from the larger context, which may leave you wondering why in the world we're reading a story about a young man getting stoned at all, but especially on Mother's Day. I invite you to listen to the scripture now, and even if you're reticent to say the words, thanks be to God at the end, which is a perfectly acceptable reaction, we'll work together on finding the good news that might be nestled among this gruesome scene. So listen now to what the Spirit is saying to her church this day. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they, the Jewish authorities, covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The relaxed pace of our world has inspired Owen and me to tackle some of the tasks that we have become very good at ignoring over the years. So last weekend, I pulled out the Tupperware bins of childhood art projects and boxes of photos and cards that I've saved, and I got to sorting. You can learn a lot about yourself by revisiting elementary art projects and journal entries about what you'd change if you were in charge of the world but I'll spare you of my findings. As I sorted through cards, I found many a card from my mother. Note she wrote for big occasions like graduations, ordinations, confirmation, and new jobs. And I found notes she wrote for smaller occasions, like the first day of a new school year, or having survived a test I'd been worried about, or notes she'd written just because. 
And regardless of whether the note was honoring a scrapbook-worthy memory or simply marking the mundane, many of them ended with the same statement. Remember who you are and whose you are. Love, Mom. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a 20th century Jewish theologian and philosopher, said that the task of faith could be summed up in one word. Remember. To have faith is to remember, he said. We sanctify the present by remembering the past. Our scripture this morning recalls two men who remembered. Stephen was a young man who was captivated by Jesus' teachings. So as the apostles began to organize themselves and pick priorities for their work, which was not a smooth process, by the way, they decided that they would need to appoint a group of people who would focus specifically on caring for widows. Stephen was among the group appointed, an original deacon. He fed, he healed, and he told people about a man named Jesus who had gotten him interested in feeding and healing in the first place. It wasn't long before the authorities took notice of this man who was quickly becoming a nuisance. And Stephen was brought before council to defend his views. The 54 verses of scripture leading up to today's text is Stephen's self-defense which is his interpretation of Israel's history. In Frederick Buechner's words, the gist of Stephen's speech was that from year one, the Jews had always been an ornery lot. They'd given Moses a hard time in the wilderness, he said, and there hadn't been a saint or prophet since whom they hadn't had it in for. The way they'd treated Jesus was the last and worst example of how they were always not just missing the boat, but doing their damnedest to sink it. Our text today is the response to Stephen's diatribe, the Jewish authorities unable to hear this limited interpretation of their own history, covering their ears, shouting to drown out his voice, and lobbing rocks, stoning Stephen to death. And buried among the shouts and the sound of stones hitting Stephen before landing on the ground, there is another man who remembers, a young man named Saul. The stone throwers needed someone to keep an eye on their belongings. So they got the young, fire-breathing, arch-conservative Jew named Saul, who was there because he thoroughly approved of what they were doing. This is our first introduction to Saul, Of course, we come to know as Paul. Years later, when he wasn't Saul anymore, but Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, he spoke of that day, remembering how it had been when he stood guard over the pile of coats and ties and watched, maybe even cheered, for a young man's death. Remember who you are and whose you are. Stephen and Paul both remembered who they were. They could easily share the stories that made up the novels of their lives. They could proclaim the ways that their lives had been transformed by compassion. They could list off their joys and laments. They could name the wounds that hadn't yet turned to scars and lift up the people who supported them and loved them, helping them to remember who they were. Remembering who we are is one way we remember our history. And as Rabbi Heschel said, to have faith is to remember. It's that important. But inevitably, the more practice we have at remembering who we are, the more curated our histories become. Stephen and Paul have curated memories. And while I don't condone the stoning of Stephen by any means, 
I too find myself wanting to cover my ears after his seemingly endless interpretation of history where there is no room for generosity, no room for grace, and no recognition that he is talking about humans just like himself. Stephen couldn't see past the shortcomings, concluding that all Jews conducted themselves like pharaohs. Paul's history was easier to recount in light of his transformation. He may not have willingly shared about his passion for breathing threats and hunting disciples had he not been able to end with, but look at how far I've come. Don't we all just love a good transformation story? Stephen and Paul are both guilty of curating history in their own favor of grasping their fists so tightly around their own narratives that they can't open their hands to receive something new. It's human to do that, isn't it? It's easy to cling to history so steadfastly that we cut ourselves off from adding to our stories, denying ourselves the possibility that the future can do more than repeat the past. How many marriages, friendships, parent-child relationships get stuck because history is remembered so acutely that you can't do more than rehearse the script that's already been written. History becomes the subtext of every conversation and suddenly a discussion about what to cook for dinner becomes about how you don't spend time together anymore and Nothing has been the same since you took that job and became more interested in your friends than your family. And after a while, you've forgotten how you even got into this discussion and walk away without an appetite for dinner or another conversation. Remember who you are and whose you are. Sometimes remembering who we are is the very thing that prevents us from remembering whose we are. Saul didn't come to be Paul by his own reckoning. Saul was resolute in his hatred for Christians. He knew who he was and how he wanted to live. It wasn't until he was blown off his feet by the Holy Spirit blinded for days and healed by Ananias, that he became the Paul we know. The Holy Spirit loosened Paul's death grip on history, allowing him to receive a future that was different. Remember who you are and whose you are. I can't recount your history for you. But I can tell you this because it is true of each of us. You are a child of God. And God, who is at work through us, even in spite of ourselves and our carefully curated histories. Maybe that's how God does a new thing. Blowing winds of the Spirit that loosen our grip on history helping us to figure out what to hold on to and what to let go of so we can open our hands to the future. Today is Mother's Day, and so it's natural to reflect on our relationships with our mothers and those who have been mothers to us, and for mothers to reflect on their relationships with their children. This day, in particular, has a way of surfacing some combination of joy and pain in everyone. Whether you are the mother who did everything right, or the person who still feels the pangs of longing to become a mother. Whether you are the child who can't make sense of your mother's actions, or feel fresh fresh grief for your mother's death. Each of us. Man, woman, parent, child has a relationship to motherhood. Months ago, Richard Floyd shared with me one of his parenting philosophies. 
The goal of parenthood, he said, is knowing what history to let go of so we don't pass our wounds on to our children. We're all going to wound our kids in some ways. That's inevitable. But parents at least have to put in the work to wound their kids in different ways. I've clung to that because I think it's the task for all of us, individuals, parents, and communities. What do we need to let go of so we don't pass our wounds on to the next generation? Trinity, this is our work during this interim time. Because to remember who we are, we also have to remember whose we are. Yes, we can recount our history and we can even curate it in a pleasing way, but not at the expense of remembering whose we are. Because we are children of a God who will blow fresh winds at unexpected times, shaking us loose from the things that we need to let go of so we can open ourselves to the future. To have faith is to remember. But as my mother wrote time and time again, you have to remember who you are and whose you are. Remembering both is what makes it a faithful act. And thanks be to God that when we remember whose we are, we remember time and time again that God works in spite of the histories we cling to and the wounds we cause. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're grateful for the gifts of life for the breath in our lungs and the beauty all around us, for the sun and the rain, for health in the midst of brokenness and newness in the midst of fear. Grateful for all of this, we offer ourselves, our lives, and our resources to God. I invite you to give online or via text using the instructions on the screen. You may also mail a check to the church. Let us give generously as a reflection of God's generosity toward us.
As we turn to prayer, I invite you to participate responsively. When I say, loving God, I invite you to say, hear our prayer. Let us pray. We gather in prayer, O God, for those surrounded by the shroud of death, for those hemmed in by illness, visible or veiled, for those weighed down with worries, for those carrying the burden of distress, for those overwhelmed by isolation. May you accompany us through dark valleys and lead us to still waters. Loving God, hear our prayer. Especially on this day, we think of mothers, those who gave us birth, those who have raised us and care for us still, those who have been mothers to us, all of the women who touch our lives. Loving God, hear our prayer. We think, too, of those who are sorrowing today, those who are missing their mothers or their children, those who mourn loved ones who are gone, those who worry and wonder, those who dream dreams that never come true. Loving God, hear our prayer. We hold families in our prayers this day, O oh God, Families that come in all shapes and sizes, single parents, couples with no children, foster families and adoptive families, mothers and fathers, two mothers, two fathers, extended families and birth families, single people and groups of people who call themselves family, all creating one story together. Loving God, hear our prayer. We pray for this church family that we retain the memory of being together and embrace unity in the midst of distance, that we hear your divine music and sense purpose beyond ourselves and perceive the needs of creation and stretch ourselves to respond with compassion. We pray that our ways be formed by your way, that our lives be shaped by your life, that our love be your love. May we sense your presence in our past and acknowledge your grace in this moment and entrust our future to your care. Loving God, hear our prayer. Hear us now as we pray the prayer taught to us by Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
as you go out into the week ahead, remember. Remember who you are and whose you are. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you this day and always, always. Amen.